Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation. And also thanks, for, thanks to Joseph uh, for, uh, I thought, a very constructive and critical review in, um, in Socialist Review. And thanks also to Alex Kalinikos, to Charlie Kimber, and to Jane Hardy, who are really good, informative, and very instructive interviewees. I, I learned a great deal from them. And anyway, I'm looking forward to an interesting debate. Um, interesting to see how it compares to my presentation last weekend at the AWL's conference. Um, uh, that sums it up. Okay. You, you, you got it without my having to explain it. Um, so uh, I've been around the labor movement for a very long time. I was in the Communist Party in the 80s, which some of you may know. I've been an active trade unionist for many years. I've known the Trotskyist movement a long time, always had a strong interest in it. And one of the things that struck me about the movement is that it, it's very unusual in this regard. It's, um, it's extraordinarily resilient. Uh, it's very widespread, and yet its record of, uh, of achievement of its goals is really very poor. As it says there, and it says in the book, no Trotskyist-led revolution anywhere at all on the planet, no national election victories, no enduring mass parties. Well, we could quibble a little about the last point, but uh, I think it's essentially correct. And the curious thing is, uh, uh, political parties which have failed to achieve their major goals over decades of existence, generally speaking, disappear. And so the Trotskyist movement presents a real interesting puzzle, a real enigma. How do we explain the, uh, the influence and the resilience? Because that's, I think, the key term, the resilience of a movement which has, in its key objectives, really not been uh, successful. So that's what I want to do in the 15 or 20 minutes. It will be obvious to you this is a huge undertaking for that length of time. I will have to go quickly over a lot of points. You should, of course, buy the book. Um, uh, you can buy it from bookmarks, but uh, I should also say you can get it online from various places a little cheaper. Not that I want to do bookmarks out of business, obviously. So in thinking about the Trotskyist, um, Trotskyist organizations and the Trotskyist movement, I, I, I was trying to figure out what kind of organization is, is a Trotskyist party. And you might think, okay, well, it's a political party. It wants to achieve political power, albeit by unconventional means, and therefore it's, it contests elections, it wants to come to office, it wants to implement policy. So in one sense, it's a party. But I think the Trotskyist movement is actually, the Trotskyist organization is better understood as a hybrid organization, which has elements of the sect and the social movement. The sect is characterized by an attachment to doctrine, a core set of beliefs, I'll say something about those in a moment. There's a very strong emphasis on the defense of doctrine the reproduction of doctrine through time, and the defense in particular against rival interpretations of doctrine. And that leads to a degree of sectarianism which plagues the Trotskyist movement. It plagues actually any movement rooted in doctrine, religious, far right, etc. It's not peculiar to Trotskyism. Trotskyist organizations, I think, also finally are social movements in the sense they both create social movements, um, anti-Nazi League, anti poltex Federation, etc., and work in other movements. And so in, understanding the, in trying to understand the influence of the Trotskyist uh, organization and movement, I think it's the interplay between these three different facets, party, sect, and social movement, that give us a lot of, a lot of uh, insights. So, um, I mean, you can see there the, um, the sources of, of information that go into the book. You can check them if you want in the book or ask me questions if you like. And the def I've defined organization in a very particular way for a reason will become clear um, shortly. So let's start with doctrine, which I take to be core beliefs that are relatively immune to empirical refutation or uh, rejection. They're not entirely immune, but they're taken to be core elements of doctrine. I mean, often embodied in programs, manifestos, statements of what we stand for, and pretty much every Trotskyist group has statements of this kind. Doctrine remains fairly stable and enduring over long periods of time because the key elements of doctrine are thought to be essential for political success. If we adhere to the doctrine, if we implement and act on the core elements of doctrine, there are nine set out in these next two slides, then we will be uh, assured at some point of political success. Doctrine is embodied in core texts to so every membership education program. As the big four, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, plus others. So in this organization, it'll be Cliff, Harmon, etc., Joseph Chunara, increasingly, no doubt, in in the Socialist Party, nobody would ever read Cliff or Harlan. Why would you? Because you've got Peter Taft to read. 
And if you're in Socialist Appeal, the old Ted, the Ted Grant breakaway, you would, you would read Ted Grant. You definitely never, ever would read that heretic and apostate Peter Taft, and so on and so forth. So each group has its own particular set of, of texts. A couple of points to make about doctrine. There are, there are nine elements of doctrine on this in the next two, the next slide. I won't, I won't read them all out. Oh, by the way, I should say, I don't read things on slides, right? So if I don't mention something, it's not because it's unimportant. It's just because you can all read, and I don't need to recite it for you. That's a total waste of time. A couple of points about doctrine before I move on. Um, first, the meaning of all these terms is contested. So when we say theory of permanent revolution is a core element of doctrine, there are many different versions of that theory, not least in Trotsky's own writings. Um, Tony Cliff coined the term deflected permanent revolution. I have to say, not one of his better works uh, in, in my view. The United Front, as you'll know, again, there are endless debates and arguments about quite what this term means, whether the anti nazi League was or was not the United Front, and so on. Uh, the relative importance of these different elements varies, again, over time so and across groups. Tony Cliff famously had little time for transitional demands, which for other organizations has been the absolute touchstone of, of Trotskyist doctrine and programs. Um, and the final point to make is that what I call here Trotsky's doctrine, when we move on to the next slide as well, is actually an amalgam of ideas from Marx, Engels, Lenin in particular, and Trotsky himself. So these are not, as it were, peculiar ideas, peculiar to Trotsky, which nobody else adhered to. Many of them taken over from Lenin. And hence, as many of you will know, of course, the Trotskyists originally called themselves Bolshevik Leninists. They rejected the label Trotskyist in the first uh, instance. Doctrine is, um, or the stability of doctrine is, um, in my view, reinforced over time by a series of mechanisms. And this is a, a real challenge for political organizations wedded to a, a core body of beliefs moving through over time. How do you maintain, how do you reproduce doctrine in the organization? Particularly in contrast to mainstream parties that are constantly chopping and changing their programs, their values, their positions. There is a degree of stability in the Trotskyist movement which is quite distinctive. Well, one is leadership. Most Trotskyist groups have, have enduring, stable, charismatic uh, leaders. There was a, a number of them there. Although, actually, when I, when I describe... I mean, Tony Cliff clearly was charismatic, no question about that. And I would say Jerry Healy as well. I mean, he was, he was a violent authoritarian and a rapist. But uh, Ted Grant, nobody could describe Ted Grant as authoritarian. I mean, some people here will have heard him speak, right? He's not charismatic, right? But all of the, most of the Trotskyist organizations of any longevity survive in part because they're very stable leaderships, reinforced often by the system of the recommended list. This does not preclude change in doctrine. Um, the SWP actually has been relatively more flexible than probably most other organizations in the Trotskyist movement, but it makes it a lot harder. It makes it much harder to innovate if you're not regularly turning over the top leadership. Um, I've read huge numbers of Trotskyist analyses of uh, the world capitalist crisis over the last few years, and the curious thing is, despite a wide range of opinion about the origins, causes, mechanisms, dynamics of the crisis, every single Trotskyist group says, without exception, our analysis, our specific analysis, distinct from everybody else's, has been vindicated by events. Right? So everybody says this. And again, this shows, if you like, the impermeability of doctrine. Doctrine is sometimes described as theory, but actually, the theory always stands the test of evidence. It is always supported by it. The evidence that again reproduces doctrine, membership, probation, education, likewise, and competition is also an important um, element, particularly in a very crowded political space. There are, in my calculation, 22 Trotskyist organisations in Britain. Anyone who's been on demonstrations in the last few years will have seen a plethora of newspaper sellers from the Trotskyist movement, the anarchist movement, the Maoist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, if I was coming into politics for the first time, I would find this genuinely bewildering. But anyway, there you are. So there's a premium on justifying your existence. What is it that makes our group distinctive from everybody else? Why do we have to exist separately from all the other Trotskyist groups? So this puts a premium on reinforcing your own doctrine and differentiating from everybody else and showing how your views are distinct. Now, in his review, Joseph said, well, yes, there is a degree of doctrinarism and sectarianism in the Trotskyist movement, but this is really down to the isolation of the movements uh, from the 
worker struggles, particularly in the 50s and 60s. That's true in that period. There's no question about that. I think that's, I think that's a valid point. But as you move through the 70s and 80s, most of the major trustees' groups became embedded in the labor and trade union movements. They built trade union working class foundations and bases. So that period of isolation pretty much came to an end. And yet, sectarianism was just as rampant. Mid-1960s, Britain had six trustees' groups. By the end of the 1970s, after the big world strike wave, we had 20 trustees' groups. So isolation is not the only factor that promotes sectarianism. It is, in my view, inherent in a movement that is rooted um, in doctrine. And the manifestations, I think you will, you will know these um, well enough. Divisions, I should say, and splits, by the way, again, are not peculiar to the Trotskyist movement. Uh, if you want to see an even smaller movement repeatedly fragmenting, you can study British Maoism. I mean, you need, quite, you need a bit of a stomach to study British Maoism, but even I haven't got that appetite. But splits, uh, I mean, there's a famous phrase people often quote from Trotsky. You know, the movement will grow through splits and fusions. Well, the record is the movement is brilliant at splits, but not so good at fusions. And actually, the SWP has contributed its own, um, its own share. You'll know also about the, the rivalry in the movement. I don't need to tell you all this. Uh, there are multiple groups competing with each other in different arenas. Um, take the university sector. Any given year, nearly half the university campuses which have trots, a Trotskyist group will typically have more than one. So you're not only fighting labor, et cetera, et cetera, you're also fighting each other. And again, that's a manifestation of doctrinarism and sectarianism. There are, I think, seven Trotskyist families. I'm not quite so wedded to the notion. I mean, maybe there are six, maybe there are eight. I don't quite know. And you'll notice that I put um, the SWP in, in, in the third camp along with the AWL. Um, well, it's, it, funnily enough, when I spoke last week at the AWL conference, they were absolutely as horrified then as you were today. Um, the, the notion of, I mean, how you construct families is a nice question. There clearly are different types of Trotskyist organization, different, type, different interpretations of doctrine. I think they have consolidated into different families. Um, the SWP does have its origins in third camp Marxism, the rethinking of the Soviet Union, the analysis of the USSR, and that, I think, is, uh, is where it originates. Whether you think it still belongs to that camp is a, a matter for debate. Um, and the consequence, uh, as we see, is today we have, on my definition of an organization, 22 Trotskyist organizations. We have 23 Fourth Internationals. Now, you can say, as Tony Cliff used to do, many of these internationals are, are meaningless organizations of no consequence whatsoever, which is true. But even if you narrow down to these six organizations which have more than a dozen or so national affiliates, you've still got half a dozen serious fourth international organizations, each claiming the mantle of international Trotskyism, the World Party of Socialist Revolution, which is not a good place, uh, I think, to be. If you turn to the Trotskyist movement as party, just look quickly at um, membership. I just think there's four phases of membership growth in the book, and uh, these will be familiar to you. So the 1950s, 60s, the bleak years, the golden age, mid-60s to mid-80s. Mid-80s, 2000, a period of disintegration and decline. The Trotskyist movement in Britain lost two-thirds of its membership over this period, fell from 20,000 to around 6,500, 7,000. The period since 2008, I think, is particularly interesting. Um, economic crisis, the ascendancy of neoliberalism, social democrat parties moving to the right, rising unemployment, Really auspicious times for the growth of the Trotskyist movement. But if you look simply at membership, uh, this has been a really disappointing period. Um, Joseph may say, well, you know, the SWP was growing up to 2010, 11, and then we had splits. Uh, we would have grown more if there hadn't been for the splits. But, you know, splits are inherent in the movement. So there's no real value in imagining a world where we would have grown if it hadn't been for the splits because there will always be splits of one kind or another. So I think the recent period is actually very disappointing for the Trotskyist movement, and not just the SWP, but for all its different components. The other facet of parties is elections. I will say nothing about this other than the results have been dismal. However you slice them, you know this, I know this. Um, I don't think you take elections quite as seriously as the Socialist Party, which harbors, what's the term I should use? Illusions, probably. In, in, the, in the electoral process. But of course, the Socialist Party now has an existential crisis because of Corbyn. I mean, it's not 
one to which you're immune, of course, but it does have a serious problem. If we um, turn to finance and organization, here I think we begin to see some of the or attain insights into the resilience of the Trotskyist movement. And what's um, striking, I think, about the movement is if you take figures from the Electoral Commission, I've used the AWL just for illustration, just to make this point. If you compare the amount of money raised per capita by mainstream parties, compare, I mean, here with the AWL because it's the only body that had data for the Electoral Commission, but you can go back through the last 40 years and I've got data for ING, IS, etc., etc. It's the same story. Broadly speaking, the Trotskyist movement raises around eight to ten times the amount of money per head of membership compared to mainstream parties, from subs, from fundraising drives, uh, collections of meetings, lit sales. It's astonishingly efficient at raising money. Astonishingly efficient. Um, and that leads, in turn, to the ability to construct organization resources, staffing levels in the Trotskyist movement. Again, you compare the movement as a whole against mainstream parties. Staffing levels in the Trotskyist movement at least 10, maybe 12 times greater than mainstream parties. So if you think of organization resources, staffing, as a key resource for a social movement, the Trotskyist movement is astonishingly well resourced, and hence its capacity to build um, social movements. And that's why I think finally the... Um, the most successful arena of Trotskyist movement activity has been in the area of building social movements. These five, I would say, and there's a chapter on this in the book, have all been in different ways highly successful movements. Um, the paradox of the movements, however, is that um, although they're intended to act as a bridge between the broad social movement, let's say the anti-Nazi League, and the party, so people get into anti-fascist activity, join the AWL branch, then move into the SWP. And clearly there's some movement that way. There's no doubt people did join through all these movements. But if you net out the numbers and you look at Trotsky's movements over the period of these social movements, the really striking thing is most of them have declined or hardly grown at all. So they've built very successful social movements but have not been the prime beneficiaries. They've built, in the case of the a &L, a movement with probably 40,000, 50,000 members, but very, very few of them came into the SWP. The anti poltax exploration, similar story, a huge movement, enormously successful, toppled the poltax, toppled Margaret Thatcher, which is kind of the icing on the cake. Um, but again, the militant tendency over this period lost around 1,500 members. Now, you might say, yes, but they were being purged out of the Labour Party. Three, 400 tops, they were losing members. They were not recruiting heavily from anti anti poltex So that, I think, is one of the, one of the paradoxes of the, um, of the Trotskyist um, movement. Uh, and the success of these social movements, anti nazi League and the rest, in part comes about because Trotskyist groups have decided to build classical social movement campaigns. Single issue, broad constituency, narrow focus, wide range of tactics, wide range of groups involved. Why do you call them a united front? A united front of a special type, John Reese's wonderful term, or a popular front, we can debate and argue. I think what is clear on the basis of the evidence is these are not effective recruiting devices. They're politically very important, very influential, and contribute to the resilience of the Trotskyist movement. A movement that can create bodies like this, like these, uh, these five, has a lot to contribute. But overall, I think what um, strikes me is that despite the success of the social movements, involvement in Marxist education, Marxist theory, and so on, is, is the limitations. I mean, I go back to the point I started, and, and this is a big question, I think, um, if I was a Trotskyist, I'd be pondering this frequently. Why no revolutions after almost 90 years of existence? Why no election victories? Why no enduring mass parties? Why, after the eight, ten years of financial crisis, are we still so small? And you can advance all sorts of stories, you know, the weight of social democracy, the legacy of Stalinism, and so on and so forth. But you have strategic leaderships which should be guiding you through these hostile environments and figuring out ways in which you can boost your membership and influence despite environmental adversity. That hasn't happened, and I think ultimately it's because of the, the rootedness of the movement in a doctrine, the romance of 1917, to use Perry Anderson's term, which does not apply has no real traction or resonance 
in the contemporary advanced capitalist world. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, and thanks to John. And I want to, first of all, commend uh, John's bravery in writing a book about contemporary Trotskyism that's highly critical and then coming to the event that probably represents the single largest concentration of Trotskyists anywhere in the English-speaking world to defend it. Um, I think people were surprised that I hadn't written a, a sort of hatchet job and maybe an ice pick job or whatever you want to call it about, about the book. But, but we have to understand it's a, it's a serious and scholarly work and it's one of the very few works dealing with contemporary British Trotskyism and therefore we have to engage with it. And just finally, by way of introduction, let me say that th the question that John says should be keeping us awake at night, why aren't we bigger, that's precisely the question that, that does keep me awake at night. I'm sure a lot of people in this room are thinking about why aren't we bigger and trying to address that. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Um, first of all, I want to say a little bit, partly for the benefit of people who, who maybe aren't as familiar with the movement, in, in what sense are we Trotskyists? Because it's, it's absolutely true, as, as John mentioned, that early in our history we engaged in, in quite a radical revision uh, uh, of some of the central ideas of Trotskyism. And one of the things that's very attractive, I think, about the SWP is it's relatively iconoclastic in how it treats the dogma, the theory, wh whatever you want to call it. I'll maybe return to that point. Um, we're also historically quite critical of some of the decisions made by Leon Trotsky. We think the decision to launch the Fourth International based on extraordinarily small groups without very, uh, very great roots inside the working class in 1938 was a mistake. We've, we've said that many, many times in the past. And we don't really uh, believe in the kind of self-aggrandizement in which we paint ourselves as the world party of, of global revolution when we don't actually have the forces to sustain that claim. So that's an element of the Trotskyist tradition, if you like, that we, we, we tend to uh, reject as an organization. And furthermore, if you look at the Trotskyist movement, it's very, very easy to have lots of fun um, poking fun at various Trotskyist organizations. Um, John mentioned his table of organizations, 22, 22 organizations. Um, I mean, two of them only have two members, <laughs> which, which admittedly is enough for a split. Um, uh, I don't know if there's anyone here from the Revolutionary Communist International Tendency in Britain. I've never heard of them. Um, now, we have to be very careful, therefore, in addressing this, that we don't um, generalize from, you know, gr if, group's been a, uh, if a group has been around 30 or 40 years and has two members, you, you'd ask fairly profound questions about the two members, whether they're the same two people as 40 years ago or whatever. Um, we have to be very careful not to generalize from that to the entirety of the movement. And John uh, does quite a good way, uh, in quite a good way, weaves between that and, and, and does distinguish. But it, it's very important that's not a yardstick for the movement. For the movement. Um, so what do we take from Trotskyism? Uh, first of all, let me say something about doctrine versus theory. Um, I think it's absolutely correct that theory can ossify into doctrine. It, it's particularly the case if you're isolated, not just from the labor movement, for, but from the dynamic struggle of working class people that theory can, uh, can ossify into doctrine. Does that mean that any body of theory is doctrine? Absolutely not. And I think the comparison John makes, where he says that the Labour Party doesn't have a doctrine, or mainstream parties don't have a doctrine because they change their views on lots of things. Let's be clear that they're engaged in a very, very different project to us. We're engaged in trying to build a mass revolutionary party to challenge and overthrow capitalism. They're engaged in trying to win votes from, a, from, a, from an electorate, usually in a fairly opportunistic way. And theory has never been a strong point in the, in the Labour Party. But I think building any kind of revolutionary organization is going to depend on a body of theory. We have to make sure that theory is vibrant, is able to change, is able to be falsified, and so on. Nonetheless, we shouldn't confuse theory with doctrine. Now, it's absolutely true that there were, there were, there were important theoretical innovations that Trotsky uh, developed. Uh, most important ones, which we've debated quite a lot in the SWP, and there was a, I remember, um, at Marxism a few years ago, taking part in a debate about, about these theories, but the theory of uneven and combined development, uh, the notion that different phases of capitalist development can be fused together 
in a particular social formation, leading to explosions of struggle in areas of the global south, which can then in an international context uh, give rise to a, tra a socialist transformation. In other words, an idea that the so-called backward countries didn't have to wait for the most advanced countries before they moved towards socialism. Um, the, the, the perspective, if you like, of permanent revolution, as Trotsky described it, I think that's a very, very important contribution of Trotsky to theory. It's one that I want to develop. And as I say, we've debated it precisely because it's a theory that was developed many, many years ago, and we have to appraise how relevant it is to the world today. But if you compare it to the kind of arguments one encounters on the left, I remember in 2005 in uh, Bolivia, uh, a country which does have a strong Trotskyist uh, tradition, but the argument from Garcia Linera, who became the sort of radical Bolivian uh, vice president in the aftermath of a huge wave of social struggle, was that we have to have, what did he put, 50 to 100 years of Andean capitalism before we can talk about uh, developing the resources that would allow us to move towards socialism. Compared to that kind of perspective, Trotsky's idea of permanent revolution, I, I still think, has a relevance today, provided we apply it in a creative manner. So that's one of the things we can take from Trotskyism. Secondly, I think Trotsky's notion of, of internationalism, the concept that we cannot build socialism in a single country, but that struggle is international, is a profoundly important in, insight which still informs our thinking today. It's not a doctrine, it's a simple fact if you're a revolutionary that you can't talk about a break with capitalism of an individual country. You have to talk about a, a regional and ultimately a global process of transformation. Thirdly, and this is a point I want to return to, there are specific strategies and tactics that Trotsky develops, often in collaboration with Lenin and so on, which I think can inform how we build movements today. And the tactic and policy of the United Front is one that I want to say something about in a moment. The fourth thing we take from Trotskyism, um, John talks about the resilience of, uh, uh, of the Trotskyist tradition. And I think you know, that's something that, that really should be commended in the sense that, that, that there's a real um, sense in which Leon Trotsky managed to keep alive the essence of Marxism, the concept of working class self-emancipation, and if we're looking to build a Marxist theory or a Marxist organization that's committed to working class self-emancipation and rejects the Stalinist road, and I think we should reject Stalinism for reasons which will be, I think, very apparent to most people in this room and certainly obvious to anyone under the age of 30 uh, in the room, then we have to talk about variants of anti-Stalinist uh, Marxism. And Trotskyism is by far, although there are other forms of, of anti-Stalinist Marxism that survived the 20th century, Trotskyism is by far the richest uh, and most powerful uh, element to survive on a global scale. Now, given that important legacy, I want to talk about some of the uh, issues in John, John's book that I found uh, controversial. I want, I want to really raise, I think, three uh, disagreements. Uh, the first disagreement really is about what are the sources of sectarianism and dogmatism. So how can this very rich uh, Trotskyist theory be ossified into dogmatism, and how can living parties become sects? That's the first point. The second one is I want to talk about the related question about whether mass campaigns such as the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign, the Anti-Nazi League, Stop the War Coalition, Stand Up to Racism, are these achievements in spite of Trotskyism or are they achievements of Trotskyism? That's the second argument. And the third thing I want to return to is this argument that Trotskyists have never built a mass working class party or led a revolution. So firstly on sectarianism. Uh, are Trotskyist organisations... Sorry, can people hear me with this mic? It keeps breaking up. Okay. Uh, are Trotsky's organizations inherently uh, a, a sect? I think we have to be clear about what sectarianism is. Sectarianism, first of all, is not the refusal of small Trotskyist groups to, refuse to, to, to work with tiny Trotskyist groups. It's not about an arrangement between different political parties. That's not sectarianism. The concept of sectarianism 
uh, is a concept born of isolation from the living struggle of working class people. Uh, Marx puts it very well. I quote quoted it in the review. Uh, the sect, this is quoting Marx, so the sect sees, as it sees the justification for its existence and its point of honour, not in what it has in common with the class movement, but in the particular shibboleth which distinguishes it from it. If we started our, di our discussions inside the working class movement with we adhere to Tony totally Close theory of state capitalism, and unless you agree with us, we're not interested in talking to you, we would be sectarian. Holding a body of theory in of itself doesn't make you sectarian, but a refusal to start from what you have in common with a real movement of working class people, that's what, what makes you a sectarian movement. And therefore, the key source of sectarianism is disengagement from the real struggles of the working class. It's, it's that engagement with the real working class uh, movement that forces theoretical issues onto the agenda, that forces us to debate and reassess our theory and our politics uh, time and time again. If you're not engaged in a real process of trying to transform the world, then your debates will be uh, debates that have no practical conclusion. You can debate till the cows com come home, but there's no test for the conclusion of those debates in practice. And if you can't test your ideas in practice, the logic is to keep splitting and splitting and splitting over finer and finer points of doctrine. And the antidote to that is engagement with real living working class struggles. So one of the, so uh, what I want to argue is one of the key sources of sectarianism isn't so much the ideas, but it's disengagement with the mass working class uh, struggle. Secondly, um, if you disengage with mass working class struggle and your theory ossifies into a doctrine, of course it can reinforce tendencies towards sectarianism. I'll give you an example, not all sects are, are, are tiny groups. If you look at the Socialist Labour League, this was a relatively large organisation in British society. The problem with the Socialist Labour League, League wasn't that it was tiny and therefore it had no capacity to intervene in struggles. The problem was the Socialist Labour League clung to the very provisional perspective that Trotsky had drawn up in the late 1930s about what would happen to world capitalism in the aftermath of the Second World War, that Stalinism would begin to crumble, that global crisis would be generalised, and that, that, that revolution was in the immediate horizon. Instead, capitalism embarks on the biggest sustained expansion in its history. Now, if you fail to recognize that transformation in material circumstances, and if you want to build an organization along those lines, yes, of course, you'll have to do it in a sectarian way. Because you have to then isolate your, people, your members theoretically from the real developments in the real world that are absolutely staring uh, in the face of working class people. So there are different sources of sectarianism, uh, but ultimately it comes down to analyses that are developed in isolation from mass movements of working class people. Finally, what, one other antidote, antidote to sectarianism is modesty. And it's something that I, I think we can't stress enough. Uh, we are not, the SWP are not an organization that go around saying we are the finished a uh, mass revolutionary party that will lead the world, world behind our banners to the, to the glorious socialist future. I wish it were that simple. Uh, we can say we're a, we're a small revolutionary organization, we have an aspiration to build a, m a much bigger mass organization, but we're very, very far from where we want to be. And it's only for engaging with real struggles of workers in which we revitalize our politics, our ideas, our organization, that we'll reach that goal. We have to be very modest about where we are at the moment, uh, even if we're ambitious about where we want uh, to be. That's the, the first point about the source of sectarianism. The second argument I want to make is about the achievements of Trotskyism in Britain. And John highlights a number of movements. Uh, he put them up on the board a minute ago. I won't, I won't repeat them. But John says, I'll, I'll quote him, the paradox of those success stories is that they were achieved precisely because Trotsky's group set aside core elements of Trotsky's doctrine and focused on building broad-based single-issue campaigns around non-revolutionary goals. Now, of course it's true that, that we don't make a criteria to participate in mass movements alongside us that you sign up to revolutionary politics. That would be ridiculous in Britain. There aren't enough revolutionaries to do that and build a, a movement on that scale anyway. 
But the point is that what we're doing inside, inside those movements is precisely implementing, as I would see it, the logic of Trotsky's policy of the United Front. In other words, what we're saying to those people who want to fight alongside us, including the leaders of those, uh, the working class movements, reformist movements like Labour and so on and so forth, is we're saying not that we'll put aside our differences, but we'll link arms with you and fight around, around these demands in an active way. And in the context of those mass struggles, we will strive to prove the superiority of our ideas and our tactics. In other words, the United Front, which is a core element of Trotsky's theory, is about working with and against the leaders of the reformist movement and the audiences that they pull behind them. And if you look at the practice of organizations like the Anti-Nazi League, the Stand Up to Racism and so on, it reflects absolutely that approach that Trotsky laid out. Not that we, in a doctrinaire fashion, simply implement what Tr Trotsky wrote in the 1920s or 30s, but we try to creatively apply that concept of the United Front to building mass struggles today. Now, the argument really uh, is, is it pointless to build those kind of movements because we can't grow out of them? And here I think we have to say there is no iron law that says we can't grow in the context of United Front struggles. The problem is if you look at the specific examples John gives, there are very, very powerful contingent reasons why organizations shrunk whilst they're building United Fronts. Uh, in the case of the SWP and the Anti-Nazi League, this was the beginning of the downturn industrial struggle. The very thing that lifted the membership of the SWP uh, goes into reverse in this period. It's not very surprising that this would be one factor in why uh, we shrank in that period. If you look at the um, Socialist Party in the same period, there was an influx of people into the Labour Party from a radical left background which buoyed up the membership of the of, of, of then militant, later the Socialist Party, who were embedded inside the Labour Party. They grew in that period. Later on, when they were leading the anti-poll uh, tax campaign, uh, was precisely the period in which they'd been driven out of the Labour Party. Now, uh, that has an impact in terms of the growth of your org or, or organization. Nonetheless, I do agree with John that it's not inevitable that you're going to grow uh, simply by leading a mass movement. And I can think of lots of mass movements in which we haven't actually been the, been the beneficiary. Growing in that, in that context requires a particularly deft combination of showing one's tactical superiority, maintaining a clear political uh, uh, position, and arguing clear revolutionary politics. Much easier said than done. But I think if you look at the kind of movements we engage in today, it's very clear we have to be, as Tony Cliff put, actually he stole it from Leon Trotsky, like a lot of his sayings, we have to be the small, sharp axe. You know, when we work in movements like Stand Up to Racism alongside large numbers of Labour Party people, we have to be able to say, we're prepared to fight alongside you to stop the racists, but we also want to go to the pub with you afterwards and have a debate and an argument about the limitations of reformism, about what happened in Greece to Syriza, about what the prospects would be for a Labour government and how it could be different. We have to be sharp ideologically as well as fighting alongside people. Final, final point, really, I, 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 is this. Um, why aren't there mass Trotskyist parties? Here, I think the argument is much more straightforward than John suggests. If you look at the period in, in the break between Stalin and Trotsky, there are only three countries on the planet where Trotskyist outnumbers the Stalinists, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, and Bolivia. And, and there were significant Trotskyist groups in countries like Bolivia. We shouldn't say there were never sizable parties, whether you call them mass parties is another question, but they were significant uh, and, and, and took part in revolutions, by the way. Um, but in most countries, the Trotskyists were a tiny minority. Not only were the Trotskyists a tiny minority, but the uh, Stalinist forces had behind them the weight of the Soviet Union, a major uh, national uh, economy, and the ideological weight of Stalinism, which managed to project itself as the inheritor of the Russian Revolution in 1917. It's not very surprising in that context that Trotskyists would struggle. But, but let's be clear, it wasn't simply that Trotskyist groupings were smaller, but Stalinists actively sought to marginalize Trotskyism in the movement for decades. You know, not to make too fine a point of it, but you know, Stalin did murder Trotsky. There was a river of blood between Stalinism and Trotskyism. There was a deliberate attempt to sideline Trotskyism. Building 
uh, mass party leading revolutionary struggle uh, requires uh, not simply the existence of organization, but it requires something else which I think is missing from John's account, which it, it, it requires an embedded, uh, being embedded in mass working class upheavals and struggles. Now those struggles did begin to emerge from 1968 onwards, as I argued in my review. And if you look at the, uh, what happens to Trotskyism in that period, there's a very, very significant growth of the Trotskyist movement from 1968 onwards. The problem is its growth from extraordinarily low levels. Uh, the, the forum of the SWP, the International Socialist, started in 1968 with under 500 members. By the end of that upturn in struggle, it had grown sixfold. But imagine what would have happened if the, tr if the SWP had gone into 1968 with the 30,000 members that the Communist Party had in that year. Imagine the growth we could have accomplished under those circumstances. Size matters in those upheavals in working class struggle. And the problem since the downturn in struggle that happened in the late 1970s is there simply haven't been those sustained waves of working class struggle from below that have created a space in which, uh, in which Trotskyist organizations, I mean the most vibrant and engaged Trotskyist organizations, could grow and become mass uh, revolutionary parties. Does that mean it's futile? Absolutely not. There will be struggle, mass struggles of working class people. Capitalism will uh, create the conditions in which working class people fight in a much more uh, significant, significant way in the future. Our job today, let me finish on, the, on, on, on this point, is to build uh, a larger revolutionary organization in the here and now, embedded inside the working class movement, experienced in leading the struggle, and prepared to critically reevaluate its theory, to look at its ideas and develop them in the light of new developments in the real world, precisely in order that in the future we can engage in the new upsurges in working class struggle, and in that context, try to build a mass revolution organization which will look very different to the organizations of today on the Trotskyist left, but will still contain at their heart ideas of internationalism and worker self-emancipation that um, originate from Trotsky's ideas. Thank you. Okay, well, one of the wonderful things that's happened in my activist life is that I've been in France for the last 35 years. So I've been able to be part of uh, other Trotskyist movements who are not the SWP, even though my politics have been those of the SWP. And uh, that's allowed me to, to learn a certain number of things. And I wanted to come back on uh, sectarianism. Uh, now, I mean, sectarianism, I think, is a really quite complicated uh, question and, and a permanent temptation. I don't think you can suddenly you know, say, well, I'm not sectarian forever. For every now and then, there's temptations to become uh, uh, sectarian. And, and I think like one of the central things about sectarianism is putting your organization right at the center, so really getting into the idea that, you know, what really matters is, you know, how was my uh, organization pre uh, uh, presented rather than what's happening to the movement. And uh, at present, I'm sad to say, say that the, the bigger organizations of Trotskyists uh, in France are in rather a sectarian phase. And I noticed the difference because Charlie Kimber the other day here said, uh, well, let me make it clear, we want Corbyn into Downing Street as soon as possible. And I thought I, if only uh, the Trotskyist organizations uh, in, the, in, in France could have this sort of attitude to the rise of left reformism uh, in, uh, in France with the France Insoumise and Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And it's absolutely the opposite. You just go to the, uh, the newspaper online of the uh, New Anti-Capitalist Party and you search for Mélenchon, you only find attacks on him. That's all you find. So there's always this sort of temptation, I think, to, to, to sectarianism, and it can, can go quite far, even though you know, this is an organization which in, in other ways is, uh, is not sectarian locally. So locally, they work with everybody, very, very wide united fronts, but as a national politics, it's uh, ex extre extremely sectarian. And so I, I think that, you know, that was one of the, th the things that made me think, that, that the debate made me think about, is how, you know, when the left reformists rise, you've got to find ways of engaging with them, and you've got to always be able to start with things you agree. It's great that seven million people voted Mélenchon, and of course he's got loads of faults, but, you know, you've got to start with that, you know, seven million people voted for a really radical program, and we have to be able to work with them. Okay, Sean from Glasgow. Uh, scrap universal credit, stop all benefit sanctions now. I thought we agreed at conference in January that posters would be produced to that effect, and yet posters appear at Marxism this year, there appears none. 
In terms of structures and breaking out of a small sect, we have to re relate to, to the millions. Millions are being grown down on, with the benefit sanctions. Billions have been used to bail, bail out the bankers, and, the, and it's the, the poor, the sick, and disabled who paid the price. You will see it in all, all our streets, the, the food banks, the people sleeping, sleeping rough, a genocidal policy where a three, the, mass, the, the maximum sanction is three years, which is like obviously a death sentence. They don't produce the, the, the data on sanctions, they, all, they, they mix them all together because they don't release the data on the three-year three year, uh, sanctions because in the same way they don't collect the data of civilian deaths in, in the war zones around the world. They don't want to know, they're not interested. The bankers got to be bailed out, and, and the mass of the population have be got ground down to, 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 to pay for them. And like, in terms of Ed Miliband was asked the question, do you, do you support, are you, is the Labour Party the party of uh, benefit claimants? So I have to ask, ask the party itself. Are we, do you have to be dragged straight, um, kicking and screaming to be, be proud to say, we are the party of benefit claimants. We are part, the party of all the oppressed and exploited groups, and we should be, it's, We've got, it's not enough to be mad and incandescent about the poor law in 1832. We've got to be mad and incandescent about the modern equivalent now. The thing is, we can relate to the millions in terms of this, the, system is a bust, the system is in crisis. It's a busted flush. Neoliberalism it can't deliver for the mass of the population. The political sense, sense is collapsing, and that's why it's that the left and the right can offer the people a solutions. And that means... We have to m label the people at the top, the monarchy, the bankers, the, the currency firms, the, the, the Tory parties, the offshore parasite party. We label them as the parasite party at the top and defend the people at the bottom. Scrap universal credit. Um, stop all benefit sanctions now. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name's Eunice Bucksh. I'm one of them people who joined the Socialist Workers' Party in 1978 uh, uh, at the time of the Anti-Nazi League. Best decision I've ever made in my life. It led to me being victimised twice, sacked, and I'd do it again twice over. And the reason why I think it is important to understand really what this debate about is about is about the difference, I think, between seeing revolutionary organisation as simply an academic matter or whether or not it's about the real struggles of ordinary working class people. You see, the way I look at it is this. You see, you, you know, it was mentioned about Cliff and that we, are, we were ossified and we said every time, constantly, the situation in the world vindicated our analysis. I've been in the SWP 40 years, as I said. That has certainly not been our approach at all. In not, when Cliff came up with the arguments or developed the argument and the theory of the downturn, he did so against enormous opposition with inside the SWP. Why? Because he recognised that actually the world wasn't the same as we would like it to be and that we had to recognise that ourselves. Painful though it was, and it was painful for a generation of militants who'd been through the upturn, who, who saw our organisation grow and grow and grow, wanted it to do so, but actually were ultimately out of step with the state that the working class was in. You see, I, I, I mean, I don't recognise my organisation from the caricature that has been put forward here. And I'll tell you why I don't. Because it misses out something very, very important. These organisations, this Trotskyist movement, is made up of men and women who fight on a daily basis for the hardest arguments we can in the face of the prevailing ideas of the ruling class. It's not simply a question of being doctrinaire. It's been a question of whether or not we are the class fighters. And that's what we try to be. But that's not been easy. And I'll tell you why Trotskyist organisations have a tendency not to, uh, well, at the moment, to lose people or have lost people. And it's this. This is my understanding. When the Bolshevik Party were formed in 1902, it's 15 years between the formation of the Bolshevik Party and the seizure of state power. It's been 15 years since we had the mass demonstration against the Gulf War. That is the difference. And what it means, therefore, is that for people coming into the movements, I'll tell you what, you might come in 
you know, some people determine there's going to be a revolution, we'll be, you know, in power, etc., and it doesn't happen. And in order to ensure that people remain with inside that organisation, we do have a approach which is to develop ideas. This is what Marxism's about. So therefore, we do, don't have, we can't simply mirror what the Bolsheviks did. And just lastly, you know, I, I think sometimes when people talk about Trotskyist organisations in a deeply sectarian manner, you know, I, I despair. I do, do absolutely despair. You know, as I said, I joined the party at the time of the Anti-Nazi League. The Anti-Nazi League couldn't have been formed just by the Socialist Workers' Party alone. It was formed by us having an approach to forces much greater than ours, to say we have something in common, which is to fight against fascism. And as Joseph rightly said, we then continued the, uh, the, the argument after that. But it is simply not the case that our tradition, and we c I can only speak for our tradition, as an adopted a sectarian approach, absolutely not. And I'll tell you what, that will be vindicated, I, vindicated, I hope, this coming weekend when we have people out against both Trump and against the Nazis. And we are working hand over fist to work with other comrades in other organisations to build that. So under no circumstances should we ever accept that our tradition, the Socialist Workers' Party's tradition, is a sectarian one. Quite the opposite. And I'm actually proud, absolutely proud, of the tradition that I stand in and that we stand in, which is not sectarian and which seeks to take our class forward at every opportunity. There's no panacea. It's not easy. We lose people along the way, but we have continued along that path and I'm proud of it. Right. She's first, then you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to say um, thank you and well done to John. I thought that was really interesting. Lots of facts and figures there. Um, and again, obviously very brave to come here uh, and debate that and debate that with us. Um, I wanted to talk about, um, you mentioned on, well, when you were talking about the decline of um, Trotsky's party memberships, uh, despite the success of their social movements, or possibly, I didn't know if the implication there was because of uh, the, because of the social movements they were involved in, no, okay, um, but I think you know you talked about the material uh, conditions and the fact that this is something that uh, Trotskyist, group, Trotskyist groups come uh, come back to, but it's not something I don't think that I don't think it's something that can be dismissed. You know, you talk about the weight of social democracy, yes, and the legacy of Stalinism, yes, both material conditions, also the demoralisation of the workers' movement following uh, Thatcher uh, and the defeat of the miners in 1987. And then the period of, very low, of the very low level, uh, level of struggle after that due to a changing composi uh, composition of the working class after many manufacturing workers were laid off uh, and then moved into previously unorganized sectors where you had to start to develop new, new, tradition, uh, new traditions of trade union organization. And I think that talking about those isn't just some excuse. Uh, and I don't think that uh, these are just adversities that the leaderships uh, of parties can simply guide, uh, guide the party through to gain or keep uh, members. And actually where this has happened, it's led to some quite disastrous results uh, for those parties in terms of bending the stick. If we think about uh, the counter-fire split in the Socialist Workers' Party um, in 2007, before I was a member anyway. <laughs> um, 2010, that's the one. Okay, so... Um, you know, and in terms of then talking about, well, the recent uh, economic and political crisis and the fact that, uh, you know, we haven't managed to turn that into a revolution, well, we're still in it, aren't we? We're still in the, the, the economic and political crisis that's going on. And actually, the UK is an, an anomaly uh, in terms of the fact that we've actually seen a revival of the major social democratic party uh, in this country in the form of uh, the Labour Party and Corbynism. Actually, across Europe, you've seen a total collapse of the major social democratic parties and in certain countries where they had a much higher period of struggle, uh, a higher level of struggle, for example, Greece, you actually had a, a large growth in Trotskyist uh, organizations. And of course, you know, think about it. 
uh, in, you know, in this country with the rise in Corbynism and, and, and the, the huge numbers of people that join the Labour Party, well, why wouldn't people just want to vote in a socialist government under Corbyn? Because what person in their right mind would actually want to give up their evenings and weekends being involved in their unions uh, and community campaigns and social movements and go out on stalls and leaflet on the streets for demonstrations when it's raining and when it's cold, when they could simply join the Labour Party to vote for Jeremy Corbyn as leader and then just turn up on the 22nd of July or whatever date it is to vote him into government. I mean, I'd, I'd love it if it were that simple too and I'd do it as well. Um, of course, it's not that simple, is it? As many in Momentum are starting to see, uh, especially after what feels uh, kind of like a hia hiatus, hiatus, thank you, hiatus uh, of, the, of the last year in terms of Labour's uh, progress. Um, for large numbers of people to come to revolutionary conclusions, uh, which is what's needed for a revolution, that's actually part of a process that, uh, that occurs in conditions of mass struggle. Uh, and we can see how illusions in the Labour Party has been a hamper on mass struggle uh, in this country. Uh, last year was the lowest level of strikes, uh, lowest number of strikes on record. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, to his credit, says, don't wait for me. And I'll just, uh, I'll just finish on this now. But Gramsci, uh, the, the Italian uh, Marxist Antonio Gramsci, said that the ruling ideas uh, in society are the ideas of the ruling class. And he called that common sense. But he also talked about good sense, the ideas that workers get through uh, their everyday experiences of having to cooperate uh, with other workers and through uh, understanding that, that, what, that acting collectively is better for their interests. Now, for the majority of the time in capitalism, most people hold both ideas, both uh, the common sense, the reactionary ideas, and, and the good sense. A minority of people hold only the ideas of the ruling class, subscribe to all sorts of oppressive, racist, sexist ideas, but a minority of people want to break with and have already broken with those uh, ideas of the ruling class. Those are the people you want to find in the, in the Socialist Workers' Party, and those are the people who want to join us, because when we move into a period of mass struggle, the majority can be won to the ideas of a totally different society. Okay. When I saw the title to this meeting, I have to say I was a bit reluctant to come because I'd kind of stereotyped you and the meeting as being full of nerdy males obsessed with sectariana. Um, and I, I do think you've actually uh, caricatured us it's as a kind of life of Brian Judean people's uh, popular front. Um, and I think the key thing that you missed when you put up there the, the core elements of, of Trotskyism um, as far as I'm concerned, it's revolution from below. You know, we do not believe that we're going to lead a revolutionary struggle. Um, we believe that our role isn't to teach the working class revolution. It's not to put forward a program which people will follow. Uh, but on the contrary, it's to create and to promote those opportunities where working class people will come to realize for themselves, as Trotsky put it, be sifted through the sieve of events uh, to see the, for themselves the limitations of the existing system, to see the need for revolutionary change, and most importantly, through the process of struggle, to get a taste of their own power and recognise that the working class is uh, the agent of change. And I think that leads to where what I consider to be the defining characteristic of the SWP and why I joined, is that wherever the class is in struggle that's where you'll find us. People make a joke about us being like a rash. Where there, whenever there's workers on strike, wherever there's a community campaign, if we're not there on the first day, we'll be there on the second day with our placards. And that's not because we want to dominate, but it's because we want to encourage and give confidence to that struggle from below. And for anybody who's not a member of the SWP here, I'd say don't start with comparing the programs of a range of sects you look at the practice. You look who is there where the struggle matters, and that is your starting point. And the theory is important, but the theory will follow. Okay, comrade in the red T-shirt here, then followed by the bald man at the back. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm just wearing a red T-shirt. That's got a distinction for me. Um, yeah, no, um, John Kelly's book is really, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting kind of sociological take on, on the whole of the British Trotskyist movement. I would recommend, you know, people read it in terms of thinking about taking stock, where we are, where we're going. It's very good on the periodization of tr British Trotskyism from the 1930s, sort of formation, the bleak years, I think you put it, in the sort of 50s into the 60s, the golden age, 1966, I think 65, 66 to uh, 1985. Um, 
and then he talks about the sort of slow sort of disintegration, I think, and sort of long takes place. So it's very, it's very interesting, thought-provoking book. I mean, you, you, you wonder, I think you could have said more about the formation years, I think, because you skirt over them a bit, because when you're wondering about why it's so resilient, the Trotskyist movement, you say, oh, it's because they've got these, partly it's these stable uh, leaderships uh, with their s slate systems uh, that, that perpetuate leadership. In fact, you know, what you miss, I think, is the sort of idea of tradition within the Trotskyist movement, the idea of these kind of veterans, the pioneers from the 1930s, you know, people like Cliff, uh, people like uh, Grant, Healy even in his own way, both became the leaders of those Trotskyist movements because they went through that formative period in the 1930s when Trotskyism was so marginalised, where the Stalinist terror... Uh, uh, persecutions, uh, slander dominated the Trotskyist movement. They held together a basic tradition. If so, that gave them that thing, and then later people passed it on. You know, when the 1980s, when people were depressed uh, in the 1980s with a downturn, it was people like Cliff and so on that could say, "Look, we lived through the 1930s. You know, you think your stuff had it bad? We had it bad. No, you know, proper fascism, proper Stalinism dominating. I think that that's one thing. And when you come to thinking about uh, s s sort of splits and stuff. Again, you, you can find a quote from Trotsky which you use saying, you know, Trotsky says, oh, splits can sometimes be good, sometimes be healthy and so on. In fact, Trotsky himself actually didn't, you know, you can find, you can find quotes like, you can find other quotes and stuff. And you can, you know, Trotsky himself didn't break from the Communist International until 1933. You could see Stalinism rising. It wasn't until Hitler comes to power, 1933, uh, he, he then said, right, it's time to rebuild a new international. He kind of tried to stay and work within it. He didn't just temporarily split off. And I forgot the time, just one final quote from Trotsky. It's one final quote from uh, Trotsky in 1923, uh, where he says, a Bolshevik is not merely a disciplined person, a person who, in each case, on each, but is a person on, in each case, and on each question forges a firm opinion of his own, defends it courageously and independently, not only against his enemies inside his own party, Today, perhaps, they will be in a minority, but they will submit because it's their party. This does not always signify he's in the wrong. Perhaps he saw or understood before the others did a new task or the necessity of a turn. They will persistently raise the question a second, a third, a tenth time, if need be, and therefore will ren render the party a service, helping to meet it with a new task, fully armed, carry out the necessary turn without organic upheavals, without fractional convulsions. I think the one thing that I think that's... What's happened, I think, over the last few years in stuff, you've had a situation, because the Trotskyist movement has not gone anywhere, we haven't grown out of a big crisis in the way we hoped, you've had sometimes a lack of revolutionary discipline, people splitting off, uh, partly, I think, due to egotism and stuff, rather than clear, actual, there's a major, real political lead for division. You know, the Trotskyist movement didn't. Trotsky said, look, don't split over the Russian question. You've all got different ideas on what characterizes the Soviet Union. There's no need to split over it. Keep together, have that argument within that movement. Didn't work out like that, but, you know, I think there's a sense as well, actually, we do want to think before we split ourselves even smaller as a movement. Okay. Okay. I'm really, really sorry we've run out of time, so the next speaker will be the last speaker from the floor, and we have to finish on time because everybody needs to get to the final rally. Okay, um, thanks. Um, I think the discussion has, uh, has been about the SWP being different from all the other organisations that John has actually talked about, and I think one of the most important things in that difference is the whole question of ideas. Now, I joined the Socialist Workers Party, that wasn't the Socialist Workers Party, the Socialist Review Group, um, and I think... We had about 30 people, but what was the most important thing that was drilled into us as we were acting, as we operated inside our unions, I was an engineer, and also in the Labour Party, because we had entered the Labour Party, because we, we were enterists, was two very important ideas. One was state capitalism, the other one was the permanent arms economy. Why? State capitalism meant that you had an idea of what... Stalinism is and, and, and what its base is, it meant that you were not in any way going to be influenced and you could actually fight against Stalinism inside the movement. I'll give you a very quick example. I was an engineer. I was in the trade union branch connected to a very powerful factory of which the, 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 the um, committee, the job shows committee, was overwhelmingly in CP. In five years, because of the way our comrades actually operated, most of those people joined the International Socialist Group. Why? Because the way we could actually argue and had no illusions in Russia and Stalin and all the rest of it. When it comes to the permanent arms economy, it means we had a defence. We we the, the illusions about parliamentary socialism were driven out of us. And you've got to remember, this was during the time of the boom, you know, when, when things were really, 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 really good. And so through those two ideas, you know, we were actually hardened. And I think that's one of the big differences between the SWP 
<coughs> and the other groups, is it's constant developing ideas. Let me give you two other ideas that have, uh, that have also been developed. One of them is about racism. Now, when I was a young, young again, when I was a young man, and that's when I used to have hair, um, <laughs> the argument about racism was pretty difficult because it was always at a sort of moralist level. It was a very liberal argument. What have we how have we actually developed that? We've actually made it into an instrument, which is really, on the, w on the way, quite an offensive instrument, because it talks about the way we fight racism is to fight against any division inside the working class, how we can come together and fight for the real issues, to defend the health service, pay, wh whatever it is. We've made it and developed it into a very sharp sword. And the same thing goes for... No, I've just completely forgot what the other idea was that I had in my mind. <laughs> you can't help getting old, comrades. Um, so, so it was, it was, it was, oh yes, because my, the, actually the, one of the most important things, how we actually develop the ideas about the um, trade union bureaucracy. Now I've been actually reading um, about the, the history of the Communist Party and the thing that strikes you when you talk, when they, when you talk about the way in which the militants actually operated in the 30, how time and time again they were undermined because they had no clear idea of the material roots of the trade union bureaucracy and how bloody treacherous it was. And one of the things is that which is so important about our party is our contribution in this understanding and it was very, very effective in the way we actually build during when, when, when the, the great upturn. And what's most important, the way we continue to develop it, is the call to contribution to actually rebuild the movements in the workplaces in the future. <coughs>
In other words, we have to avoid both the temptation of sectarianism and liquidationism. And that's a tightrope that I think revolutionaries uh, have to walk in this period. Third and final point. What it, just to say something about the SWP, my, my proudest moments as a member of the SWP are not I've produced a, a theoretical article or a book that has this great innovative idea in it. My, my two the proudest moments as an SWP member, I think one of them was at Friends Meeting House where we were all going for the rally in 2001 where we had a mass me uh, meeting that packed out every single seat and then overflowed into the street outside to launch the Stop the War Coalition. That was one of my proudest moments as the SWP. I'll give you the other moment. It was stood outside East London Mosque when we stopped the English Defence League marching past that mosque and we broke that organisation. Uh, and that organisation went home demoralised and didn't continue growing. And we have to do that again. You know, we're going to be out on the streets on Friday and we're going to be out on the streets on Saturday. Again, organising to stop the fascists and the right marching in the streets. And we'll do it again and again. But I don't apologise in the context of those struggles for asking people to join uh, the Socialist Workers' Party. Not because I think the SWP is going to create a revolution. Revolutions are created by the crisis of capitalism and by the upsurge of working class struggle, not by revolutionaries. Not because I think the SWP embodies the future socialist society we're building. I'm sorry, I mean, I love the SWP, but the world we're building is not going to look like an SWP branch meeting. It'll be much, much... Uh, different to that. <laughs> but I think, and here I agree with a, a central point that Trotsky did make, that the indispensable uh, feature of you want to win in a revolutionary situation is not simply the militancy of the working class, but is an organization rooted in the working class, a mass revolutionary party, capable of leading that working class to victory. And that's why I would urge people, uh, if you've enjoyed Marxism, you like the ideas, and you like what we're arguing, please do join the SWP. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks very much. I'll be brief because I know I'm the only thing standing between you and the final, uh, the final rally. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and also thank you particularly for I, 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 what I thought was a very constructive and comradely debate. I think I'm sure there's a temptation in these kind of situations to attack the outsider and and explain the, the error of my ways and my various heresies and so on. But so, very, so I think it's a very good debate. It's a very comradely debate, and I, I really do appreciate that, and I think it, it, it reflects well on everybody in the room. Three points very quickly. First, I think the question of sectarianism is more complex than either the SWP is or it isn't. I mean, the, it, it has many different facets, and there are different degrees. On the one side, yes, the SWP was first to recognize the downturn in the industrial struggle in the late 1970s, Equally, again, another example, I think, late 1990s, first to recognize the significance of the anti-globalization struggles at that period from Seattle onwards and adapt accordingly. On the other hand, we have three anti-austerity organizations. We have competing groups in different trade unions. We have competing groups on university campuses. So there is a mixture of openness, cooperation, alongside different degrees of sectarianism. This is a much more complex picture. Second, Joseph said... The Trotsky's movement hasn't grown much in recent years because of the decline in working class struggles. Yes and no, there's been a sharp decline in strike activity. We all know that. Um, the UCU, of course, the, the, the great exception, my branch has grown as much as Joseph's, I'm pleased to say. And we've now got the nice problem of turning membership growth into capacity, into local bargaining power, which is a good problem to have. Um, but there have been many, many other struggles over this period. Think about the struggles over student fees, over anti-war, anti-austerity over Gaza, the bedroom tax, welfare cuts. There's been a huge range of struggles, not in the workplace by workers against employers, but plenty of struggles. There's plenty of opportunity, there have been opportunities for the Trotskyist movement to get involved, to capitalize, to explain their ideas, and to benefit from these struggles. And it's, I, I, I would be disappointed that, we, that you hadn't or we hadn't done uh, more. Final point on the social movements, um, I think it is the case that through building social movements, the levels of Trotsky's movement growth have been very disappointing. I agree with Joseph, however. I think the links between the construction of social movements, their composition, their management, their tactics, and growth, on the other hand, are much more complex. I mean, there are much more complex stories here. There are contingent factors going on. So it is a, it is a complex story. And I, th I think that's right. That's, uh, as we say in academia, we need more research to sort this out. But um, meantime, next week, I should be back to sorting out my union branch. And then on Friday, I'll see lots of you on the big demos. Thank you very much indeed.